Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So as some of you may be able to tell by now, I have my new setup in my new house because like I said in my case updates video, I did just move. So this is how it's going to be for the time being unless there's other things that I decide I want to change about it. But yeah, this is my new setup. But anyways, today's video involves a disappearance of a young woman that is truly baffling. I really felt the need to go ahead and get Kelly's story out there to get more people to recognize her face and hear her story and get more people looking for her. This case definitely has the potential to be solved and I truly think that more people just need to learn about her case and if anybody knows or saw anything for those people to come forward with what they know. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Harry's. I've been using Harry's for years now and that's because they are the only razor that I can use with my very sensitive skin. Harry's high quality premium blades were made in their own company in Germany and they're complete with a precision trimmer and a flex hinge to give you a close, comfortable, and smooth shave. Not only are their blades amazing, but they have a new two-tone design with deeper grooves for an improved grip, which makes shaving just that much easier. I have the chrome color and I think it just looks so nice in my shave shower and it's so easy to use. I also love Harry's Foaming Shave Gel. It's perfect for those of us with sensitive skin like I have. Their Foaming Shave Gel is made with loving ingredients like aloe and hyaluronic acid. I swear by their razors and their Foaming Shave Gel, they're the only razors that I can use without getting some really bad razor burn. I used to avoid shaving if I knew that I had to wear leggings or tight jeans the same day or even the next day because of how bad my razor burn used to get, but now that's not something that I have to worry about with Harry's. Harry's is also super convenient, arriving in the mail at your front door so you don't need to spend the time going to the store and shopping for your razors. Harry's also offers a starter kit which gives you everything that you need for a close, comfortable shave. You'll get your five blade razor, a weighted handle, a blade cover, their foaming shave gel. The exciting news is that my subscribers can sign up to get your starter kit for only $3 when you use my link down below and head to harrys.com slash rachel shannon that's harrys.com slash rachel shannon to get your starter kit for only three dollars thank you again so much to harrys for sponsoring today's video okay so with all of that being said let's get into today's case Today, we are going to be discussing the mysterious disappearance of Kelly Brannon. Kelly Brannon was born May 2nd, 1984, and she grew up in New Hampshire. She was known by those around her as being a free-spirited, adventurous, outgoing woman. She was described as being a stick of dynamite. She was so motivated, driven, and she fought hard for the things that she believed in. She was an animal rights activist, she was anti-fascist, and a woman's rights activist. She was one of the first protesters at the Occupy Wall Street protest in 2011. She had once marched from New York to DC, and she was present at the Standing Rock Sioux Pipeline protest. She was so passionate about the things that she believed in that if she felt strongly about something, everybody around her knew it. She was also known to have a kind heart for those who were struggling. There was one time that someone in her neighborhood was about to be evicted from their home because they could not afford their rent, so Kelly decided to set up a fundraiser and she raised enough money to pay for that person's rent so that they could keep their home. That's just the type of person that she is. Growing up, she always loved adventure, new experiences, traveling, and just seeing what the world had to offer. When she graduated high school, she spent some time hitchhiking across the country, recording and documenting the entire adventure. She went as far south as Mexico, heading all the way up to Canada before returning back home to New Hampshire. Eventually, her dream was to turn that footage into a documentary. After that, she went on to college and she got her master's degree in creative writing. From there, Kelly went on to New York where she worked for 10 years. While there, she got more and more into the music scene, especially in the punk music scene. She created her own one-woman band, played the guitar, and sang. After that, Kelly moved to Florida where she continued to play music. She performed at small venues, street fairs, and pretty much anywhere that she could. By June of 2019, Kelly had been on her music tour playing at different venues when she met her boyfriend, Eddie Emerson, in Gainesville, Florida. 
Eddie had been living there for a few years, and he said that when he initially met her, he was just drawn in by her. She was such an interesting personality, and he was just fascinated by her. He loved how passionate she was and how much she stood up for her beliefs. For the following four months, Kelly had been living around a few different places. Now, she and Eddie mostly lived in or around Gainesville. There was one month where Kelly went back to New Hampshire to visit her mother and give her a kitten that Eddie had gotten her. After that, she returned back to Gainesville. Once there, her and Eddie decided that they actually wanted to move to Detroit, Michigan, buy a $2,000 fixer-upper home and fix it up to live there. Kelly had actually been diagnosed with PTSD due to childhood trauma, and around that time, she had actually gotten a lump sum of cash in disability for her PTSD. So, in July of 2019, Kelly made it back to Gainesville. They packed up all of their stuff, including their eight chickens, which they put in a dog kennel, and Eddie's dog into their cars. They planned on each driving their own cars with all of their belongings packed in them, and then they were just going to drive all the way up. They left for Detroit on July 9th, planning to take the I-75 the entire way there. However, only about an hour and a half into their trip, so about 77 miles into their trip, Eddie's truck had actually broken down. He said that the truck has always had its transmission issues. He's never really driven it on the highway and especially not that far. So it completely broke down and the transmission had to be replaced. So that night after the truck had broken down, they actually just went over to a gas station and slept in the grass there because they didn't want to spend too much money on staying in hotels. After that, the next day, Eddie had dropped his truck off for repairs in Live Oak, which is where they had been stranded. While in Live Oak, they frequently went to a local Mexican restaurant called Armando's, and while there, they had been talking to people who lived around the area, and then the owner of Armando's actually told them that he had a chicken coop that they could keep their chickens in for the time being while they were waiting for their truck's repairs. So, so they ended up leaving their chickens in the coop of the owner of Armando's. And then that same night while they waited, they actually camped outside on the property of an employee who worked at Armando's. So not the owner's property, but an employee who worked at Armando's. That is where they spent the night outside while the chickens were at the coop of the owner of Armando's. After that night, they were still in Live Oak and they actually camped out for a few days at a couple of different places as they waited. However, there were a lot of issues with finding a new transmission for the car. It actually sounded so frustrating based on how they explained it. They actually ended up having to drive three hours south down to Lakeland, Florida, where they found a transmission that they thought that they could use to fix the truck. So they went down there, they got the transmission, and then they drove three hours all the way back up to Live Oak, and then it gave the shop the transmission but it was the wrong transmission. So they did end up getting a refund and all that. I don't even think they ended up having to go all the way back down south to return it. They just gave them their money back and called it there. So as you can imagine, they were starting to get very frustrated. So by that night on July 14th now, they ended up going to a hotel called the Sunshine Inn. This was the cheapest motel that they could find in the area because again, they just didn't want to keep spending money. At this point, they had gotten all of their chickens back in that dog kennel and of course they had their dog and things seemed like they were finally going to calm down for a little bit but they didn't at this time, Kelly had insisted that they bring their eight chickens into the room with them, but Eddie wanted nothing to do with that. He said that he found them a grassy area in the shade to leave them outside, but Kelly didn't want to leave them outside all day and night. She wanted to bring them into the room with them, so her and Eddie carried the kennel with all eight chickens up the stairs and into their room. At this point, Eddie said that he was just getting really frustrated he said that they were very hot, they were tired, and they just were not expecting this kind of stress on a trip that was supposed to be fun, and it was supposed to be this turning point in their lives where they found this nice little house that they could settle down in. So that night, Eddie said, quote, I already had my dog with us. We didn't need the chickens in the room too. It was a long couple of days. 
I was tired, so yeah, I got angry. I threw my hat on the ground and I yelled. I said, I'm tired of your stupid shit. And yeah, I was mean. After that, Eddie said that Kelly got into her car and then drove into town. As she was out, he said that she was texting him very angrily, calling him an asshole for what he did. And at the same time, she had been going around to different bars and she was drinking. So the text messages start at 6.28 p.m. As I read them, a lot of them are kind of sent right in a row. So when I say Kelly and then the message, and then I say Kelly again without saying the time in between, that's because they're pretty much sent one right after the other and they're all within minutes. When there is a larger time gap, I will let you guys know. By 6.28 p.m., Kelly said, right, well, good job keeping up the act for a few days. Kelly, stupid shit I want to do. Sure, Eddie, blame it all on me and take it out on me as usual. Kelly, glad you're enjoying your room. You can reimburse me for the one I paid for I shared with you. Kelly, maybe Natalie can come down and keep you company. Thanks so much for yelling at me today for shit that wasn't my fault. Kelly, you just care about yourself and, quote, your truck. I've already spent $200 on your bullshit and you yell at me after we already worked out a plan. But you don't care. I'm in the heat, effed as usual. You got the room, the AC, the shower, and the TV. Eddie, got a room for us, but okay, Kel. Kelly, sure, so you can yell at me and call me stupid? Eddie, sorry. Eddie, can you bring a pizza back or something? Kelly, seriously, I'm not your effing lassie. You're gonna have to do better than that. Kelly, and don't let the chickens out till I take a shower. Kelly, you want pizza? You're gonna have to do a dance for it. Send pics. By 6.48 p.m. on Eddie's phone, there is a 21-minute call between Eddie and his mother. And then by 6.57 p.m., Kelly texts Eddie saying, coming back with the supplies, I'm expecting a dance. Eddie said in an interview that that's sort of just her personality coming out. She was trying to make light of the situation, saying that she just wants a little dance from him to be kind of funny. So that's where that kind of comes comes from. So at around 7 p.m. that same night, Kelly returned back to the motel with pizza and wine and things seemed to calm down for a little bit. Eddie said that there were two beds in the room, so he was laying down on one of the beds when she came in and she lay down on a different bed. Eddie said that at that point, he got up from his bed and then went and laid in the bed with her and then hugged her. Then she was talking about how she had done a lot of traveling by herself, that she had been to New York and Detroit by herself. So he said that he said, okay, then you go to New York or Detroit by yourself then. So she got back up, grabbed the pizza and the wine, and she headed out of the motel room. As she was leaving and heading out of the door, according to the website that Kelly's family had set up, Eddie says, bye, C-U-N-T, as she's walking out of the room. Eddie says that about 10 minutes after she left the room, he followed her back outside, first to apologize and also to get a piece of pizza but as she saw him walking down the stairs, she drove off. After she drove off, she went into the downtown area and she continued texting Eddie. At 7.18 p.m., the texts are as follows. Kelly, I knew you were just using me and I was right. Kelly, I'm sure your mom and sis will help you out. Kelly, you're a liar. At 7.22, Kelly says, it's the same as the ankle monitor. You're all lovey-dovey while you have it on, and as soon as it's off, I'm A-C-U-N-T. You're all lovey-dovey when you think that you have herpes, and as soon as Natalie tells you she doesn't have it, I'm back to C-U-N-T. I'm sick of being treated like shit. Between 7.24 and 7.27 p.m., there are three separate phone calls between Kelly and Eddie. We don't know if these are outgoing calls or incoming calls. Then by 7.29, p.m. Kelly says, clearly you don't want to be together. Prob your family influenced that, so just effing be honest for once. Kelly, and I'm not going to verbally be punched by you anymore. Go find another girl that you can call a C-U-N-T. Use and treat like shit. Why don't you have the insults for someone who deserves it? 7.33 p.m. Kelly, I could give you the world and it still wouldn't be good enough for you. Nothing ever will be and I'm sick of trying. I did nothing wrong. Kelly, I'm getting the F out of here before my money and soul is gone. Good luck. Kelly, it's never been me and you. You'll never prioritize me and I'm done being treated that way. I'm getting my own motel room at a place where I'm not yelled at. I'm sorry you don't care about the chickens. So glad you got a shower. Kelly, it's all about Eddie. 
Kelly, not this time, asshole. Eddie texts her back, I need my phone charger and Gordon's bowl. 741, Kelly, too effing bad. Kelly, and yeah, I know you need those things more than me. Kelly, should have thought about that before you called me stupid and A-C-U-N-T. Kelly, and threw me away. Kelly, I even came back with food and booze and that still wasn't good enough because your fam makes you think you're perfect and you can do nothing wrong. Eddie replies saying, and the chicken's food. Kelly, I need a partner, but maybe I don't. Maybe I'd rather be alone than yelled at for no reason throughout the day. By 7.45 p.m., Kelly says, why? You're just going to get rid of the chickens anyways. At 7.44, it says that the text is missing, so maybe this was deleted. We don't exactly know, but by 7.45 p.m., Kelly texts him back and responds to this missing text saying, why? You're just going to get rid of the chickens anyways. 7.47 p.m., Eddie texts her saying, phone's about to die. 7.47, Kelly responds, cool, maybe working things out with me should have come before catching up with your fam. You could have always called them back and you'd have better to talk with me, but they always come first, which is fine, but I can't relate, especially when there's no emergency and they just called to say hi. Kelly at 7.49 p.m. says, you have your precious phone charger. Eddie responds, I don't have the wall block. Kelly, so call your friends because you're always somewhere else anyways. Kelly texts him again, it's not here, you have it. Kelly, and it'll do some good to do something else than spend all the time on your phone. Maybe turn the TV off too and think about why you'd tell me all this love shit. 7.51, there is another text missing. 7.53 p.m., Kelly, I'm effing gross because I've been in this Florida shit since last Thursday. I never plan to spend more than a day here. I hate this place and I'm not going to let you make me feel like garbage because you get off destroying me. 7.53 and 7.54, there are two text messages missing. 7.55 p.m., Kelly, oh wait, I like found it. Eddie, okay, you have my shit though. I'd rather not leave, but if you have to, please bring me my wallet, charger, and animal food. Thanks. 7.55, Kelly, like. 7.55, Kelly, again. Uh, I'm so cool and 22. Kelly, yeah, this shit again. All you care about is your stuff. 7.56, Eddie, Gordon is hungry. Eddie, and so are your chickens. Kelly, there's a gas station two minutes away. I'm sure they have dog food. Kelly, oh, my chickens. Kelly, Eddie, I know if I go back there, all you're gonna do is rip your shit out of my car and name call me. Your family called to make a divide and you made your choice. Eddie, yeah, he's really hungry and I'm not buying more since there's a bunch in your car. Kelly, it was baby, I love you. Baby, I'm sorry. Baby, you're the love of my life to baby, give me my stuff. Kelly, no effing way I'm falling for your shit again. You already got me to spend tons of money and time. I'll never get back fixing your shit. Kelly, I'm not gonna be some white trash Florida girl letting you throw me around in the parking lot of a cheap motel. Kelly, which is why I got the F out of there. You didn't come outside for me. You're done with me once again. Kelly, I know you think I'm a pushover, which is why you treat me like garbage when you feel like it, but not this time. Kelly, F that. Asking me to go get you a pizza while you're shit talking about me? F you. Kelly, you're insane. Kelly, I even got wine and made a joke about a dance and you say, you're not getting a dance. Kelly, you just use me. Effing crazy and awful. I keep falling for it. Kelly, I'm better than this. Five minutes later at 8.08 p.m. Between that and 8.13 p.m., there are four calls between Eddie and Kelly. And once again, we're not sure if they're incoming or outgoing between either one of them. By 8.13 p.m., Kelly says, and I'm not stealing your stuff. Maybe you shouldn't have put stuff in my car when you were planning on yelling at me, name calling me, and throwing me away. Kelly, I'll bring your shit back to Mechanopy not exactly sure what that word is or what she was trying to say. 813, Kelly, already on the freeway. 815, Kelly, I just want a boyfriend who cares about me more than his phone and his stuff. I don't think that's too much to ask. Then by 821 p.m., there is a phone call once again to or from Kelly, but again, we're not sure if it's incoming or outgoing. 8.21 p.m., Kelly says, and I know your family will be happy to hear you found someone else. When are you going to tell them about, and then there's a separate text, Natalie. I'm sure you'll get the truck fixed and she can come up here and you guys can go to Massachusetts. Be her knight in shining armor. Apparently, she doesn't have herpes, so you can date her now. Then, once again, between 8.23 p.m. and 8.29 p.m., there are four more phone calls to or from Kelly between her and Eddie. So, as all of this was going on, as these text messages were going back and forth between the two of them, 
Eddie was saying that he was sitting in the room and the room started to smell because of the chickens being in there. So Eddie knocked on the door of their neighbor and got his help and then he came in and helped Eddie carry the dog kennel with eight chickens in it down the stairs and put them in the grass. Eddie went on to say that he didn't want the chickens in the kennel all night, that they needed time to get out and walk around so they brought them downstairs put them in the grass and took them out of the kennel so that they could graze at this point kelly did return back to the motel and she gave eddie a hug he said that because of her soft spot for animals she was happy to see that the chickens were out and roaming around and grazing at this time things were starting to calm down again but by the time it started getting dark, they tried gathering up all of the chickens so that they could put them back in the kennel for the night. But as they were trying to gather them up, they were only able to get five of them back in the kennel. The other three, they just couldn't find. Somehow they ran off and they didn't know where they went. So Eddie was saying that the chickens will be fine, that they need to sleep and that they can just leave them out and that they'll find them in the morning. But again, Kelly wanted nothing to do with this. She wanted to make sure that all of the chickens had their kennel in their room and she wanted to make sure all eight of them were safe before they went to sleep. So at this point, Eddie says that he was just tired of chasing around the chickens and arguing with Kelly. So he went back into the motel room and Kelly stayed outside and she was trying to wrangle all of the chickens together. Eddie said that he was inside laying on the bed or the couch and as he was doing so, Kelly continued calling him and angrily texting him. Once again at this time, she got back into her car and was driving around. This time she went to the store and bought a bottle of rum and then she went back to the hotel and was just sitting outside and was crying and drinking the rum. So at this point, the text messages start at 8.54 p.m. and they are as follows. Kelly, you wouldn't even let me rearrange my shit or help after I helped you leave the farm and everything else. Then some time passed and at 9.20, Kelly texted him again, but maybe that's not what you wanted. I'm so glad you showered and get to play your guitar. Someday you'll know what it's like to be hurt. Kelly, thanks for abandoning the chickens. Kelly, material things will always mean more to you. Kelly, I'm taking that transmission back and getting $300. That's what I spent on this bullshit. Eventually, by 10.30 p.m., Eddie said that he got a knock on the door from their neighbor, who at this point is only known as JR. JR told Eddie that Kelly was outside and she was drunk and hysterical and she was trying to drive her car. So he went outside and of course he saw that she was drunk and crying. So Eddie said that he took the keys from her at that point because obviously he didn't want her drunk driving. At this point, she was horrified and Eddie said that she just thought that he was trying to steal her car. And he said, you know, no, I'm not trying to take your car. You just shouldn't be driving since you're super drunk. After that, he said that he went back into the room with her keys, leaving her outside, and then he laid back down. So at this point, she was outside, didn't have her keys, no way to leave or get anywhere. And he said that he he was well aware that, you know, the door would lock behind him in the hotel room and that she didn't have a key. So he knew essentially that he was locking her outside with pretty much nowhere else to go. But he said that at this moment, he didn't really think about that, that the door was locking behind him and that she didn't have a key. He just thought that he was sort of saving the day because he stopped her from driving drunk. By 10.50 p.m., Kelly continues texting Eddie. The text messages say, Kelly, thanks for ignoring me and locking me out, con man. I hope you're sending lots of hearts to all your old hookups. Kelly, I know how you are and maybe it was my mistake to get involved with a millennial who is addicted to their phone. Sure. Kelly, you and Nat have so much more in common than you think. I'm sure you can still get back together and you treat her well. You should be with someone you want to be nice to and that's not me, obviously. Would be cool if you could give me some gas money I spent driving to get your transmission. 10.54 p.m. There is a text message missing. 10.55 p.m. Kelly says, I'm going to shop first thing tomorrow and
and swapping the rest of our stuff. I'm keeping the chickens. Kelly, you're welcome for helping you. And guess what? You're not stuck with me anymore. Woohoo. Go hook up with all the Natalies you want, scumbag. 10.59 p.m. at Kelly. You never cared about me. Just yourself, which is why you, and then another text message, leave me out here and not give a shit. So glad your fam called to have your back and blame me once again for the shit you did. 11 p.m. at Kelly. You're so spoiled. One day you're going to be in my position when you fall for the wrong person who betrays you. 1101, Kelly. Have fun with that. Always looking out for someone better will lead you to no one. 1101, Kelly. Asshole. Then 30 minutes passed without Eddie responding or saying anything. So by 1132 p.m., Kelly texted him once again and said, Yep, nothing. I can honestly say I've never met a man who said he loved me who doesn't give a shit about me till you. Sleep well. I know you are. The only things that keep you up are drunk, vomiting people and owls, not losing a girlfriend. Then another hour passed, and by 12:30 a.m., now going into the next day, she continued texting him. Him, saying that she was going to press charges for him stealing her car and at this point you know all throughout these text messages there have been a lot of spelling errors it's been a little bit difficult to read them but at this point it was getting more and more obvious that she was very heavily drinking and the spelling errors and just random mistakes and a lot of just random letters being thrown in there, it's getting a lot more obvious. 12.30 a.m., Kelly texts Eddie again saying, you're like every abuser I know. Kelly, it's fine. Want the car? Awesome. Kelly, I'll leave with nothing once again because I just keep giving you shit and all you want is shit. Well, I'm taking the registration and reporting it stolen. 12.34 a.m., Kelly, enjoy the car. Got my guitar and new bag of clothes. Guess you figured you'd get the car eventually. Kelly, congrats. You won tell your fam. 12.35 a.m. Eddie says, why don't you come sleep? Kelly responds, sure they'll be proud you after this bitch once and for all and got a car out of it. Kelly says, nah, I'd rather starve to death or jump off a bridge or be beaten by vultures than share a room with someone like you. Eddie responds, K. Kelly says, I'm leaving, calling it in as stolen. Kelly, I'm sure glad you got to play your guitar while you can. Kelly, I'm pressing charges. Kelly, oh yeah, I hate the cops, but I'm not going to let you use that to steal my car. Kelly, F you. Kelly, and you still have the nerve to eat my food. This one was spelled H-A-G-Y-H-E-N-E-R-B-E. -E -E, so have the nerve was spelled like that just to sort of show what kind of mental state she's in and how the spelling errors are, I guess. Um, at 12.42 a.m., Kelly says, can't wait till they knock at your door. Kelly, you think I'm bluffing? I'm not. You stole my car. Kelly, yeah, I can do better. Kelly, you just wanted my car. Kelly, I get it now. Kelly, but it's not yours. Kelly, what am I supposed to do when you steal my car? Kelly, you think Natalie is going to bail you out? Kelly, maybe your mom and your sis after what you told them. After all of these text messages, Eddie said that by 12.45 a.m., he said that he fell asleep. He said that at this point, he had shut off his phone because he was just tired of getting the text messages, I guess, and he said that he wanted it to be quiet so that he could go to sleep. That next morning, Eddie said that he woke up and Kelly was not there. Once again, Again, she didn't have the keys to her car, so there's no way she could have driven away. And then, you know, she was an hour and a half away from home, I guess, where she was living, but she didn't really know anybody else in the area. So he was a little bit concerned. He said that he went outside and looked in her car to see if she had slept in her car that night, but she was not there. He said that that's the time that he checked his phone and he saw that Kelly had continued texting him and she actually left him a voicemail at 12.59 a.m. In the voicemail, she basically said that she's getting her own motel room, that she reported the car as stolen, and that he should be expecting a visit from the police soon. She went on to say that, you know, all of his money is for him while all of her money is for the both of them. She said that maybe she should go to Detroit all by herself or go to Iceland. She said that he's not a good partner, that she's sick of the abuse, and then at the end, kind of abruptly, she said that she's going to get into the car now, and then the voicemail cuts off. Now, I am going to play the voicemail, but I do want you to look out for a couple of things. There is a part at the very, very end where it sounds to some people like she's saying no right as it's cutting off. So I do want to hear your guys' opinion on that. I will slow down the very last part. So I'm going to 
gonna play it normally and then I'm gonna play it again with the last part like slowed down so I can see if you guys think that it sounds like she's saying no. Eddie would go on to say that to him it sounded like there were voices in the background of this voicemail. He also said that he found it strange that there was no sound of wind or the outdoors or anything else in nature, things like that. So those are things that I want you guys to listen for. Also just listen for if there's anything else that you think is strange, let me know in the comments what you think of this voicemail. Oh great, you're sleeping. I'm so glad I got that message from you before telling me how you're sorry and you love me and how you want me so much and all that bullshit just to get my car. Well, anyways, I've heard to my own room at the Sunshine Inn and I've reported my car stolen and told them who stole it. So expect cops knocked at your door and I will be right next door at my own motel room because I'm not allowed to stay with you because I want to Oh, you get the benefit because you only look out for you. It's your money. It's just for you. But my money is for both of us, essentially, which is bullshit. And I should obviously definitely do the Detroit thing on my own or go to Iceland. Like, you are not a partner. You're not a partner. You turn on me a split second. You turn me out of nowhere. And I deserve way better. I did, I did nothing to be called a fucking stupid idiot. And I did nothing to be called a cunt. So, you know, I'm sick of your abuse. So go find... Oh, I'm going to get in a car right now. All right, bye. So go find... Oh, I'm going to get in a car right now. All right, bye. Yep. Now, it was found that Kelly actually did not end up getting her own room. There's no record of that. There's also no record of her reporting her car as stolen. After this, on July 15th, Eddie said that he started looking everywhere that he could think of to find Kelly, but he said that once he couldn't find her in the area, he was starting to get really worried. So, at this time, he did report Kelly as missing, but he went on to say that the, the police didn't take him seriously at all. He said that they just thought that she was a grown woman who got upset and probably just walked off after the argument and that she would be back soon. Eddie said that by July 16th, the neighbor that they had at the motel, who again, we just know as JR, he had offered to help look for Kelly. He said that JR took him walking around this random trail and he said that at first, you know, Eddie trusted JR because he thought that he was just trying to help because JR is a local and he knew the area better than he did. So he figured that JR would know exactly where to look. But Eddie said that as they were walking this random trail that JR took him down, that he just thought that this was a big waste of time. So they went back to the motel room. At this point, Eddie said that JR had offered to take some of his and Kelly's belongings from their car and into his room to look after them. It was obviously hot out. The items were just sitting in their cars, so he wanted to make sure that they could go into his room where they would have AC and they wouldn't be destroyed by sitting in a very hot car. So Eddie agreed, and then he put most of his and Kelly's stuff into JR's room. After that, Eddie said that he started driving Kelly's car around and was looking for her. In the days that followed, he said that he printed flyers and was putting them all around the downtown area. He said that after this, he did go back to Gainesville to search for her there. Then he went back to his parents' house in Massachusetts, and then he went to her parents' house in New Hampshire to give some of her stuff back to her mom. Then he contacted any of Kelly's friends that he knew about and asked if they had seen her, but obviously nobody had. Then he said a few days after Kelly's disappearance, Eddie went back to JR's room to get his two guitars and his amp, but they were all missing. All of his stuff had been stolen by JR and was pawned off, so obviously this was very frustrating to him. Now, during the initial stages of the investigation, obviously police started by looking at their hotel room and questioning Eddie about all that happened that night. He basically gave the story that I just mentioned. In the hotel room, they noticed that Kelly left behind pretty much all of her personal belongings and then in her car, they found her phone charger, her wallet, and her purse. Then, according to cell phone records, police found that Kelly's cell phone had pinged in the downtown area of Live 
Dave Oak after leaving Eddie this voicemail. So to them, it showed that after leaving this voicemail, at some point, she may have gotten into the car. So they think that at some point after leaving this voicemail, she did get into the car with somebody and that's how she ended up in Live Oak downtown. Then in addition to this, they found that Kelly's phone had been shut off and disconnected from her cloud account at around 2.10 a.m., about an hour and a half after she left the voicemail. So once again, it showed that maybe this is around the time that her phone had died. The other thing that police did was talk to the people around Live Oak who interacted with Kelly and Eddie to gather more information about their movements while they were there. There were witnesses around the motel who said that they saw Kelly walking east away from the hotel carrying her guitar slung over her shoulder. Now, there was surveillance video of this that does show her in the parking lot, but all that's been released is a still image. There hasn't been any other video released, so we don't really know anything else about how she was walking, if she was very intoxicated, if there was anybody else in the area, or if anybody was following her, or even really confirming what direction she was walking in. Then police found out more about the man who was staying in the room next door to Kelly and Eddie. Turned out that JR was actually a criminal who was very well known for his criminal activity around the area. He may be involved with drugs, but that hasn't really ever been confirmed but he is known around the area to be a thief. Obviously, we saw that he sold a bunch of Eddie and Kelly's belongings, and he was actually living at the Sunshine Inn when he had that room next to Kelly and Eddie. Now, going back in the timeline just a bit, the morning that Eddie said that he realized Kelly was missing, he said that he spoke with JR to see if he saw or heard anything around the time that Kelly went missing. He told Eddie that he hadn't seen anything and that he'd actually gone to bed at around 10.40 p.m. that night, right after he knocked on Eddie's door to let him know that Kelly was drunk and crying. However, another witness at the motel claimed that JR was actually outside and he had been badgering Kelly to try and get her to come into his room that night. She obviously kept denying and he kept pestering and he actually was like persisting until he ultimately went to bed at around 1 a.m. So this is far past the time that he told Eddie that he went to bed. Now, I will say right off the bat, police had come out to say that they don't think that JR has anything to do with Kelly's disappearance. However, Eddie said that it really bothers him the fact that JR lied to him about when he went to bed. Why is this something that he would lie about? So Eddie said that even though he also agrees that he doesn't think that JR actually did anything to Kelly, he thinks that he may know more about what happened since he is involved in criminal activity around the area and he knows the criminals around the area. So he thinks that it's possible that JR knows a lot more than he's letting on. Other than that, as frustrating as it is, there hasn't been anything else actually confirmed about that night. But the more police looked into Eddie and the more they spoke with people who knew Eddie and Kelly, they found out that Eddie and Kelly's relationship wasn't as stable as they made it out to be. On December 26th of 2019, 911 received a phone call from a neighbor of Kelly and Eddie's to report that they heard one of their neighbors in a very loud and intense fight. In the 911 call, the caller says that they heard the male saying, if you don't stop, I'm going to hurt you. And then they heard the woman saying, Eddie, stop multiple times. The caller said that they continued to scream and fight outside in the alley behind their house, so the neighbor's house, and it did sound to the caller like there was a physical altercation. Throughout the call, you can hear them fighting and yelling at each other in the background, though it is hard to tell exactly what they're saying. Here is the phone call now for you to listen to. Communication. What's fine? Is this an emergency? Um, it might be. Uh, my mom's neighbors were at her house from the outside fighting. Okay. And the address? I don't know their address. It's a, it's a house behind. 
they're in the okay. alley behind that house. Okay, and can you repeat? And, and um, the fight is coming from, where is the fight coming from again? They're in the alley behind my mom's house. Is this your, is this your mom's address? She said if you keep doing this, I'll hurt you. Okay. Okay. She keeps saying, Eddie, stop. Okay. I don't know if you can hear them. But you, you guys need to get some okay. we, Yeah. Yep, we're sending help. Do you, do you need are they physically the fighting or are they, are they just sounds, yelling? It sounds like they're physically fighting. She just keeps saying, Eddie, stop. We're hearing noises. I don't know if they went okay. inside, there, but he's screaming. Uh, it's not as loud, so I think that it went inside. And he's just screaming. Okay. And this is coming from the house behind you? There's a little shed in the house. It's not the house directly behind us. There's an There's a... A house off 8th Street that has a, a fence that's partially built. Okay. Can you hear? I don't know if you can hear them. Yes, I can hear. There's an alley that's access back behind there. Okay. She's saying, please calm down, Eddie. She just said, out. It sounded like he hit her. Okay. She's saying, get out of here. I'm putting in notes. So I'm still here with you, and we have help on the way. She keeps saying, I was just talking to Cheryl. I was just talking to Cheryl. Please just okay. Talk. She said her shoes okay, yeah, I can. Inside. You can hear them? Yeah, I can hear them. Okay. I'm just saying, so you know, this is, I've never heard them like this, but my mom's been complaining of them being out there yelling and screaming at each other. Okay. Okay. Do you know if anyone has weapons? I, I don't know. Okay. Do you know anyone is injured? Seven foot and around her yard, so I can't see them, but you can hear them. Okay. Do you know if anyone is injured? I don't know. No. It's not. Okay. And do you know who these people are, or do you know their names? No. Well, she keeps saying Eddie, so I'm assuming that the guy's name is Eddie. Okay. She's saying you got mad at me for talking to my friend on the phone. Okay. Do you know if anyone has been drinking or using drugs? I have no idea. And you said, is there a history of violence for that... Um, house? I, I don't know about that, but we've been hearing them argue for I don't know how long it's been going on. Is this the first time you've heard them today, or has this happened in the past? For, first time, no, I've, I've, we've never heard them sound like they're physically fighting, but they've been okay. fighting verbally for, I don't know if it's weeks or now it sounds like he's hurting her. Okay. He's, he's saying, get the fuck out of here. Okay. I'll fuck you up, he just said. Okay. Oh, I wish they would get here soon. This is really stressful.
I don't want her not here. She's going to say it. I want to stay on the phone with her while we until I get her. Okay. Are there children present over there? Do you know? Um, my I just had my mom take my son back inside. Okay, so you're you only have twenty. You don't know about over there, right? I don't know over there. I, I okay. don't think so, but I don't know. Okay. Just we have them on the way. Just let me know if you hear anything different. Okay. Oh, she said stop. I know you're drunk. Okay. There's a lot of thumps. I don't know what's going on. It sounds like they might be back inside. And that's be my behind, mom's house. Yep. Yeah, it'll be behind that location. Can you try and show them where, that, where it's at? They're not going to be able to get to her from her house because she has a fence around her backyard. Okay, I don't want you to do anything that will put yourself in danger. Okay. And now I'm, I'm getting worried because I'm not hearing any noise. Are you aware if they went in? It, it had inside. sounded like they might have gone back inside, uh, but now I'm not hearing anything. Okay. No, I'm hearing, I'm hearing them again. Sounds like she locked herself in somewhere because you say unlock this now. You hear him saying unlock this now? Yeah, he's saying get the fuck out. He said, you came back here, I told you not to. Okay. All right, that's what I Okay. At your residence? No, I, that, they're back in the alley. They, I just heard them, yeah, I'll get on the ground. Okay. Thank you very much for calling in. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. You're welcome. All right. All right. Bye. Good night. When police showed up to this 911 call, Eddie was arrested at that time for hitting Kelly in the face. After this, of course, as we know, they did continue their relationship, but friends of Kelly and Eddie say that their relationship continued to be tumultuous. So, of course, it is thought that Eddie might have had something to do with Kelly's disappearance. He was the last person who saw her, and as we can see, he is known to have these violent outbursts, and she went missing right after the two were pretty much arguing for hours and hours and hours that same day and in the days before. Now, I will say police have said that Eddie has been very cooperative. He has done multiple interviews, a few of them I have watched and will be linked down below. And to me, he does seem like he's out there and he is trying to spread awareness and talk as much as he can about Kelly's disappearance. So, for the sake of this video, I don't want people, you know, going to him and 
accusing him of hurting her or being responsible for her disappearance if he is truly grieving and if he is truly looking for her. But obviously, as we know, he is a perpetrator of domestic violence, which obviously is not okay. It never will be okay. It's not cool. There's no reason for that. And he obviously should be scrutinized for that, I guess. He should be blamed for that because there's absolutely no reason to be hitting a woman or hitting anybody for that matter during an argument, no matter how bad the argument is. Also, police have said that he continues to be a person of interest and that he is not being ruled out. So, I personally don't think that there's enough to say that he is definitively responsible for Kelly's disappearance, but we can't rule it out either by any means. Now, I will mention that as far as we know, as far as been released, there is no real evidence to say that anything had happened inside of that room at the Sunshine Inn. There's no sign of a struggle in that room. There's also no witnesses to say that there was a physical altercation that happened outside of the room. So, there was no one that saw, you know, Eddie pushing around Kelly at the time that she was known to be last seen. There was no witnesses to show that anybody else was pushing Kelly or harming her when she was last seen at the motel. So, there's no evidence of foul play happening there. But there's also no witnesses to say that they saw her getting into a car from the hotel. So, did she walk away from the hotel and then get into a car somewhere else? Did something happen to her there and just nobody saw or heard anything. Did something happen in the hotel room, but Eddie just had plenty of time to clean up after himself, and again, we know that that room was probably a disaster. There was chickens in there. There was a dog in there. It was probably a mess, so who's to say that there wasn't evidence and that it was just missed because of how much of a disaster the whole situation was? So, obviously, again, there are thoughts that Eddie was involved, but there are a couple of other possibilities outside of Eddie's involvement. One person that police and I guess the public have looked into is that employee of Armando's who let Eddie and Kelly stay on his property for the night when, you know, their chickens were in the owner's coop. Now, it has been said that the owner who let the chickens stay in his coop People have said that he's the one who let the couple stay on his property. However, the family of Kelly have clarified that, yes, the owner let the chickens stay in the coop, but it was an employee of Armando's that actually let them sleep at his property. So, these are two completely different people. So, people do not think that the owner of Armando's is responsible or involved but people have looked at the employee as possibly being involved or knowing more. Then, in one interview that I saw, Eddie mentioned a friend of Kelly's named Zach. Apparently, this is a friend who would do pretty much anything for Kelly, including driving an hour and a half to pick her up if she called him and asked him to. But Zach did say that he did not hear from Kelly at all that night, and I don't think there's any evidence to show that she did ever call him. I'm sure police looked more into this if he was someone that was brought up in the investigation, so... I don't think there's any evidence to point to him, you know, being involved or knowing where she went or having anything to do with her that night, at least that I'm not aware of. Then there are thoughts that she could have left from the Sunshine Inn on her own accord that night, and of course, this could have happened in any number of ways. Maybe she met someone in town while she was driving around that night. She is the type of person who is very known for being outgoing and social, so it's not unlikely her to get to know people around her as she's out and to have chats with people. So, it's thought that maybe during one of the times that she went out driving around the town, going to bars, picking up pizza, things like that, maybe she met someone and got their phone number and then reached back out to them and that that person gave her a ride and then something happened to her after that. Either you know, at the hands of whoever this person was, or maybe somebody dropped her off somewhere and then she was met with foul play at that point. The other possibility is the fact that maybe she left on her own accord and is still out there somewhere. 
Over the months that followed her disappearance, there were sightings of her in Tallahassee, High Springs, Live Oak, as well as in Lake Park and Camilla, Georgia. However, none of these sightings have been confirmed, and it's thought that none of these sightings are actually her. I saw in one source that it was confirmed that it was not her in any of these sightings, so that kind of doesn't really lead us anywhere. The other thing with this is that everybody who knows her, literally everyone around her has said that yes, Kelly is a little bit of a transient. She is known to sort of go off on her own accord and, you know, do her own thing for a while, but there has never been any time or any reason that Kelly would go this long without contacting anybody. Any time that she has left on her road trips or moved out of state from where her family or friends lived, there has never ever been a time where she did not contact anybody for an extended period of time. Eddie included said that there is no way that she would have just left and not contacted anybody, especially two years later. Eddie came out to say that she loves her mother deeply, very deeply, and she's now in her late 70s and you know, who knows how good she's doing, if she's sick, if she's not sick, but no matter what, he says that she would have contacted her mother at some point. The other thing that people think, of course, is that maybe she was in this state of a mental crisis and that she just snapped and then left because of that and that she's just not mentally well enough to know what's going on or know how to contact anybody or even, you know, be in a state where she knows that she should contact somebody. This could be true. A lot of people who have looked into this case, including Eddie at some points, have said that maybe in a to her PTSD and her anxiety that maybe she had borderline personality disorder. She clearly has a lot of attachment issues, some mental health issues, so some people think that maybe she has just been in homeless camps and has been homeless and then, you know, no one's seen her and she just hasn't had any way to contact anybody this entire time. But again, at the same time, no matter how deep into mental illness someone may be, I personally don't think that it's possible that she still wouldn't have contacted anybody over the course of the two years that she's been missing. I feel like at some point you would snap out of it, you would get the idea to call somebody, you would get the idea to tell somebody your name or something. I could see this being a theory that could be possible if we were still two months out or even six months out but it's been two years. I just don't picture someone being in that m much of a mental crisis for two whole years that they just don't think to contact anybody in their family, especially when your mother is in her late 70s. You would contact her at some point. You would think to do that, and she hasn't. So those are really the main ideas and theories in this case, but there are a few other things that I would like to discuss. Now, it's thought, at least by Eddie, that she did get into a car that night. Going back to the voicemail that she left, it sort of sounded like maybe she was like walking down the street away from the hotel as she was leaving this voicemail and then, you know, someone pulled up, either someone that she called to pick her up or someone random and then she said, okay, I'm getting into a car and then hung up and went in the car and then went on her way to downtown Live Oak. I personally think that if she did get picked up, she was not picked up at the motel because again, people did see her walking away. Nobody saw her getting into the car with anybody. Nobody saw her talking to anybody that we know of. So I personally think that she, if she did contact someone to come pick her up, that she would have said, hey, come to the Sunshine Inn. I'm going to start walking your way so that you don't have to drive as far. Whenever you see me, that's where I'll be. I'm carrying my guitar. It's pretty hard to miss me. Also, Eddie is totally convinced that there are voices in the background of that voicemail, but many people have analyzed this video. They've slowed it down. They've looked at the background sounds of this video and people have said that it seems like this noise that Eddie seems to be hearing is just beeping. People don't think that there's any voices in the background and honestly people have said that the fact that he's so adamant that there's voices in the background that that's a little bit suspicious when to some people it's pretty clear that there's no voices so that's just something I'll put out there but 
I don't really know what to make of that. Another thing that people have said is that maybe the voicemail was doctored in some sort of way that before this was handed over to police that maybe Eddie downloaded it and then edited it and then that's what was sent to the police that this isn't the original audio file. I don't know exactly what people are pointing to to say that, you know, it's been doctored. I think the fact that she was talking and then so abruptly she said, okay, I'm getting into a car. People think that maybe there was more in between that and that that's when it got cut off or people think that maybe the at the very end where people think that there's a no, that maybe she's like, saying something that has to do with Eddie that, you know, no Eddie or something like that. And that's where it was cut off. But other than that, I don't know anything else about why people think this was doctored in any way. And I don't know if police have confirmed that, if police have said that this is the original audio file. If you know more about this, please let me know. But that's as far as I know about that. So, at this point, family and friends are just left to continue on their searches for Kelly. They have a Facebook page dedicated to Kelly. They've made a website. They have a Twitter. They also have a GoFundMe, which of course will be listed down below. This is to help pay for a private investigator to continue to search and investigate Kelly's disappearance. People care so, so very much about Kelly and they are just so desperate to find her. So at this point, I do think that all it takes is spreading Kelly's case as far and wide as we can and people coming forward with what they know. I can't say what I think happened because at this point, I truly don't know. I don't want to speculate too much or cause any damage to this case, so that is where I'm going to leave it. I do sometimes get more detailed into the theories, but for this case in specific, the family is sort of saying what they think happened or I guess they're not really saying what they think happened, but they're sort of just putting this information out there. Eddie is kind of talking about what he thinks happened, so I don't want to go off on, a, you know, a beaten path and completely just say something out of the blue that totally is just putting the blame on somebody that could totally just not be involved, but I do want to sort of throw some ideas out there to get people's minds working. So at this point, the fact that nobody has heard from Kelly, the fact that she hasn't voted in any of the elections, which are so, so, so very important to her, those are the things that are the most concerning to her family that show that something must have happened to her. Kelly Brannon is known to be a white woman standing at 5 feet 5 inches tall, weighing 130 pounds. She has blue eyes, black hair that is graying. She has a circle tattoo on her right hand near her thumb. She was last seen in Live Oak, Florida, wearing a white t-shirt and black shorts, carrying her guitar. If you have any information regarding Kelly Brannon, I urge you to call the Live Oak Police Department Criminal Investigations Division at 386-364-7463. You can remain anonymous by contacting the Suwannee County Crime Stoppers at 386-208-8477 or tips. So that is all the information I have on today's video and now I want to know what you guys think. What do you think happened to Kelly? Do you think she's still out there or do you think something happened to her? Let's discuss this and any other of your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!